We are in Daf Chaf Beis. Um, we were talking yesterday about a machlokas between Rabbi Avahu and Chizkia, two Amoroim, who debate the issue of when the Torah says, Thou shalt not eat something, does it include an Isser Hana'a or not? So Chizkiah says, no, when the Torah says don't eat something, it means just don't eat it, but you're allowed to get Hana from it, unless the Torah writes the verb eating in a passive sense of lo ye achel, it shall not be eaten, which implies not only may you not eat it, but you may not bring it to a state of where you can acquire food from it, which is an Isser Hana. Um, according to Rabbi Avahu, any time the Torah says don't eat something, then it also includes an Isser Hana'a. And that becomes more problematic for Rabbi Avohu. As we'll see, we're going to ask some questions on Chizki as well. But it's more problematic for Rabbi Avohu because we're going to go through a number of different places where the Torah says don't eat something, where there is no Isser Hana. So let's now analyze that. Yesterday we talked about Nevela, we talked about Trefa, and now we're going to talk, now we'll go on to the next topic, of where it's Masiv Rav Yitzchak Nafcha. We're going to talk about Gid Hanasha. So it's the fifth line. Rav Yitzchak Nafcha challenges that. He says, "Vaharei Gid Hanasha derachmona Amar al Kain lo Yochlu v'nei Yisrael as Gid Hanasha." We see that the Torah speaks in in the <coughs> prohibition of eating when it comes to Gid Hanasha, and according to Rabbi Avohu, we would therefore expect there to be an Isser Hana as well. Utsenan Sholech Adam Yerech Lenachri v'Gid Hanasha b'Sacham Ipnei Shemekamon Nikar. And there's a halacha that you're allowed to send a uh, behind leg of an animal as a gift to a non-Jew, and you don't have to worry about the marasayin aspect. Now, what marasayin is there going to be? A Jew may be witness to the fact that the Gentile received the gift from a Jew and may mistakenly think that the hind leg is kosher. So you don't have to worry about that. The reason why you don't have to worry about that is because you can tell if Nikor, if the act of removing the sciatica nerve, if the Gidanasha, was done or not. So it's not like the Jew is going to mistakenly think that this is kosher, that the Gidanasha was already removed. He'll see that it's sealed, and, it's, and, and, and no Nikor was done. So that's why it's permitted. But you see from here that you're allowed to derive benefit from the Gidanasha by giving it as a gift to your non-Jewish friend. So it's a kash on Rebbe Avohum. So the Gemara answers, Kesava Rebbe Avohu, Keshehutra Nevela, He Vechelba Vegida Hutra. Answers the Gemara that Rebbe Avohu is of the opinion that when the Torah permits you to get Hana from the Vela, that's what we learned yesterday, because the Torah says, Lo Sochlu Kol Nevela, you may not eat any Nevela, but what can you do? Lagera Shevisharecha Titnan Vachala Omachola Nachri that you're allowed to give it as a gift or sell it to a non-Jew. So you see that the Torah gives you special dispensation to get Hana'a <clears throat> from the Vela meat, and part and parcel of that dispensation is that any non-kosher meat you're allowed to get benefit from. And therefore, when the Torah permits Nevela, it automatically permits all the components of the animal with for Hana'a, including the Gid Hanasha. So Hanicha Laman Da'amr Yesh Begidin Beno Saint Tam, Laman Da'amr Ein Begidin Beno Saint Tam, Ma'yikha Lameyma. So the Gemara says, but that only works if you hold that Gid Anasha is one of the edible components of an animal. And this is a machlokes, as we're going to see in just a minute, between Rabbi Yehud and Rabbi Shimon. One says that the Gid Hanasha is not considered to be an edible part of the animal. It's like, a, it's, like a, it's like a bone. It's no different from a bone. It doesn't have any substantial taste to it. It's not like meat. And if it's not like meat, then it's not included in the dispensation for Hana'a that the Torah gives for the meat of the nevela, because there the Torah says, don't eat the meat of a nevela, but rather give it as a gift to a non-Jew. So you see that the Torah is only permitting hana'a for meat, but if, if gidanash is not meat, so then you're back to the question of where do you see a pasuk that you're allowed to get hana'a from it? So this is a machlokas. If you hold that it's like meat, so then you learn it from nevela. But if you hold it's not like meat because it doesn't have flavor, so then what are you going to say? So uh, so man shamas lay the amr ein begidin beno saint tam. So the Gemara says it's very simple. Which tana holds that the gid hanasha does not have flavor and therefore it's not like meat? Rabbi Shimon. So that's Rabbi Shimon. To Tanya, as the Brisa says, ha'ochel negid hanasha shel behema temeya. If a person eats the sciatic nerve of a non-kosher species of animal, such as, let's say he takes the sciatic nerve from a pig and he eats it. So Rabbi Yehuda, Mikhaev Shtayim, Rabbi Shimon Poter, Rabbi Yehuda says you're liable for two things. 
you've eaten from a non-kosher species of animal, you've eaten from a pig, and number two, you've eaten the, the gid anasha. So you've done two violations, you get lashes twice. Reb Yehuda says you get nothing. You haven't done any prohibition. Why? Because the, it's, the gid anasha is only prohibited for a kosher animal, and also because the gid anasha is not considered to be the meat of the animal because it's, it's like eating the, a non-edible portion of a non-kosher animal, which is the Torah never prohibits. Like, for example, if I was to eat a football, which is made out of pigskin, I would not incur the penalty of eating a pig, because that's a non-edible portion of the, of the animal. So, too, you're not in violation if you eat a non-edible portion of a pig, huh. right? Which is the reason that you could permit, theoretically, you could permit pig gelatin, which is made from the bone of a pig. But we won't go there right now. But the, the, that's that's the point of Rebbe Yehuda. The gid is non-edible, right? And so, so you know, so that's the problem. So therefore, the Gemara says, if Reb Shimon is the one who says that you're putter because he holds that it's not meat, Reb Shimon hachanami da'asir bahana. Well, that's consistent because Reb Shimon Taka holds that a gid is asir bahana, and that fits in with our contention that it's not included in the dispensation that was provided for nevela to get hana from it. If you hold that it's not subsumed under nevela, so then it should taka be asir bahana. So the Kumar says, well, lo and behold, that's how Reb Shimon holds it is asir bahana. The Tanya gid anasha mutter bahana diver Reb Yehuda Reb Shimon oser. That uh, this is exactly the same machlokas. Reb Yehuda says that you're allowed to be- please someone open for Benny. That oh, it's open already. Thank you. The uh, the uh, gid anasha is mutter bahana according to Reb Yehuda. Reb Shimon says it's asir bahana. So you see, again, it's very very consistent. Reb Yehuda who has been very well defended. That concludes our discussion for gid anasha. Now we're going to go on to the next prohibition of consumables. And we'll have to see. Yeah. Does that mean that Rabbi Shimon wouldn't allow us to use a pigskin football? No, 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 no. His only issue is on the Gid Hanasha. But if, if it's a non consumable part, then it wouldn't be included in the exclusion. Oh, I see what you're saying. So should it be Usr Bahana? Anything that you can't eat from a tray fan? According, from a bale, or a according to Rebbe, well, no, not necessarily, because, because the argument, I guess, would be. Is that you're, if you're allowed to eat the pigskin, then you're surely allowed to no, get. No, if it's like it says the gita nasha, you don't eat it. So if you don't eat the skin of the pig, I know I'm going off top door. No, 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 no. Rip Shimon only asers bahana the, the git the gid hanasha of a kosher animal. He doesn't aser the gid hanasha of a of a non of a non kosher animal. So therefore, any non edible portion of a non-kosher animal is completely consumable. You can do whatever, no, whatever, whatever you, you want. You can eat it as well. Not only can you use it, you can you get hana get, and you, you can eat it. You don't get motive for eating the tray. It was a crisis. You you know that? that's, 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 that, that's what he's saying. Okay. So now the Gemara says, Vahare Dam. Okay, so now what about what about blood? Now blood, the Torah also says you cannot eat it, so we would expect that blood should be asr bahana according to Rabbi Avahu, right? The Rachmana Omer Kol Nefesh Mikem Los Ochal Dam, that every Jewish soul may not eat blood. So Utenan Elu Ve'Elu Mis Arvin Ba'ama. But yet we learn in the Mishnah that when you have different kinds of karbanos, the bloods of the different kinds of carbon chata, some which are brought inside and some which are brought outside of the uh, of the hechal. In any event, all of those bloods commingle in the aqueduct that runs through the temple and then eventually flows out through a sewer pipe going out of the temple into a place called Nachal Kidron. The Yotzel and Nachal Kidron, Benim Karm Leganon and Lezevel. And then when you harvest this coagulated blood, it was a commodity because it could be used as fertilizer. It was very rich in iron and, nutri- and nitrates, probably, and whatever other nutrients. But you had to remove the Kedusha off the blood, so you had to actually pay money to the Beis HaMikdash in order to use it. And Umoa Limbo, and it's subject to Mi'ila, whether it's the Arais or the Rabbanan is discussed elsewhere. But the point is, the point is, is that you see that you're allowed to benefit from the blood provided that you remove the Kedusha off of it. But according to Rabbi Avahu, if the Torah says don't eat it, it should be Yasser Bahana permanently. The Gemara answer is shiny dumb, the iskash lemayim. The answer is, is that blood is also an exception because the Torah compares blood to water. 
Dichsiv, as the Torah says, Lo tochalenu ala arts tishbechenu kamoin. You shall not eat it, you shall not eat the blood of an animal, but rather pour it on the ground like water. So the fact that the Torah compares it to water, just like water is mutter bahana, so too blood is mutter bahana. That's what we're saying. Ma mai mutar mafdam mutar. But the Gemara now says, ve'ema kamayim hamiskan simal gabi hamizbeach. But who says that all water is permitted for hana? Maybe we're talking about a kind of water that is not permitted by hana when this comparison is made, like the water that's used on the water libation on Sukkot in the in the temple that it's sacrificial water and you can't get hanaf from it. So maybe that's what the Torah means. So the Gemara answers, Amar Rabbi Avohu Kamayim Rov Mayim. So Rabbi Avohu says no. When the Torah says it's like water, it means it's like the majority of water in the world, the vast majority of water in the world, which is, uh, which is permissible. So the Gemara says, Midi Rov Mayim Kisiv. But that's not what the Torah writes. <coughs> so what right do you have to take liberties in interpreting it as that blood is like most water, if that's not what the Pasuk says. The Gemara says, Elo amar avashi kamayim hanishpachim velo kamayim hanisachim. The answer is, is that when the Torah says, pour it to the ground like water, there are two verbs in the Torah that imply pouring. One is shaficha and one is nisuch. Shaficha is pouring something for, to, to waste, as to dispose of it, to be shofech, right? But when you're menasech something, you're pouring it in a worshipful way, on a constructive way, you know, as, as a form of worship. So therefore, the fact that the Torah uses the word tishpechenu and not tenasechenu, it teaches me that the Torah wants us to compare blood to water that is wasted or disposed of and not water that is used as a libation. And that's how I know that it's compared to the permissible water and not to the for, 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 forbidden water. But maybe the Torah is comparing it to water that is poured in the worship of idolatry, and there you can say that it's going to waste. So the Gemara says, no, hasam nami nisuch ikri. No, even water that's poured in the presence of idolatry, it would not be called tishpechenu. The Torah that would be a misplaced verb if the Torah was comparing it to idolatrous water, because the chsiv yishtu yein as the Torah says that idolaters drink the wine of their nesach of their libation. So you see that the verb nesicha would be the proper. Uh, um, Nisuch would be the proper verb. The fact that the Torah writes Tishbechen, who tells me that it's per, per, referring to permitted water, not forbidden water. So now the Gemara switches gears. Even though we're still going to be discussing this issue of blood, the question now is you've explained according to Rabbi Avahu why you need the, for the Torah to compare blood to water. <coughs> but to tell me that it's Mutter Bahana. But Chizkiah holds that blood is mutter bahana even without that comparison to water because Chizkiah says that just because the Torah says don't eat it, it does not mean that it's asr bahana. So therefore, Chizkiah, Lamai Hilchasa, Iskashdam Lamai. Why, according to Chizkiah, does the Torah compare blood to water? That's for another reason. For Rabchiah bar Abba, Dharma Rabchiah bar Abba, Amr Rabbi Echanan, Minayin Ladam Kadshim Shainu Machshir. And we had seen this halacha just a couple days ago. How do you know that the blood of kudshim meat does not act as a machshir, does not prime it to be makabal tumah? As the Torah says, do not eat the blood, but rather spill it on the ground like water. And what we'd learn from that is, dam We know that there are seven fluids that act as a machshir. One of them is blood, but it has to be analogous to water because that's the, that's the primary exemplar of that which acts as a machshir. So when the Torah says that blood is like water to act as a machshir, it has to be like water in the sense that it is poured to the ground to be disposed of. But sacrificial blood is not disposed of, it's used in, this, in worship, and that's how I know that it does not act as a machshir. So that's the way Rebbe, uh, that's how Chizki is going to learn the Pasuk. So water used that way also wouldn't prime. Water for, I'm not sure. That's an interesting question. Would water that's used for Nisuch HaMayim act as a machshir? We don't have any indication from this necessarily. Not that we don't know. We don't know because here we're both talking about water that's poured out and blood that's poured out. Now, 
the Gemara could have at this point said, well, then how does Rebbe Yavahu know this halacha, that blood does not act as a machshir if he uses the alars de shpechenu kamoim for something else? But the Gemara does not go in that direction. The Gemara concludes the discussion here and now goes on to our next challenge to Rebbe Yavahu, which is Vaharei Aver Minachai, which is Aver Minachai. The Torah says, do not eat the soul together with the flesh, which tells me that I'm not allowed to eat from a living animal, which I know applies to both Jews and non-Jews. One of the seven Noahide laws also is that he may not eat from a living animal. And we have a b'risa that says as follows. How do you know that you're not allowed to pass or hand a cup of wine to a Nazir? And you're not allowed to offer to eat aver minachai to a non-Jew. <coughs> now, what you're doing is you're aiding and abetting them to commit an avera. How do you know that that's prohibited? Because it says you're not allowed to place a stumbling block before a blind person. You're not allowed to aid and abet the commission of an avera. That's the way we learn the pasuk. Now, what do you see from that whole teaching? You see that the whole reason why I can't a gentile, I can't give a gentile, Avram Minachai is not because Avram Minachai is Asr Bahana, it's only because I'm aiding and abetting him to in the commission of an Avera. But if I could get Hana from it without being over and Lufna Yiver, then it would be permitted for me to get Hana. So for the example would be Halaklov and Shari. If I want to feed it to my dogs. My dog has no prohibition of eating from a living animal. There's no Isr Avram and Achai on a Kelev, on a dog. So I'm allowed to give my, it seems to here, I'm allowed to give my kelev, Aver Minachai. So that's a kasha, I'm getting hana from it, and yet the Torah says, don't eat it, it's a kasha, Rabbi Avahu. Shiny, Aver Minachai, de iskash ladam. So the Gemara says, you know why? Aver Minachai is scripturally connected to blood, and since we've established that blood is not Asr Bahana, Aver Minachai is also not Asr Bahana. And how do you know this? The Torah says, be strong and do not eat blood, because the blood represents the soul. So the word hana Nefesh, the soul, is in the Pasuk by Aver Menachai, and it's in the Pasuk in Dam. So we learn that the Halachas of Dam apply to the Halachas of Aver Menachai. Just like Dam is Mutter Bahana, so to Aver Menachai is Mutter Bahana. So now the Gemara says, okay, fine, that works out according to Rabbi Avahu. But Ulechizki, Elamai Hilchasa, Iskash Aver Menachai, Ladam. But according to Chizki, why does the Torah scripturally connect Aver Menachai to Dam? The Gemara answer is, Amr Lecha, Dam, Hu, Deiska, Shlever, Menachai. You got it all backwards, with the Chizki, it will tell you. It's not that we're connecting Aver, Menachai to Dam, but rather that we're connecting Dam to Aver, Menachai to teach me a halacha about Dam. Ma Aver, Menachai, Aser, Af, Dam, Menachai, Aser. It's to tell me as follows, that if I did not have any connection between blood and Aver, Menachai, I might have thought that the only kind of blood that the Torah permits is the blood that comes out of an animal once it's slaughtered, which is the blood of a dead animal of a halachically dead animal, right? But let's say blood that is drawn from an animal that's still alive. Maybe there the Torah does not prohibit that blood. So comes along this word hanefesh in both psukim to tell me that just like a limb from a living animal is prohibited, so too the blood from a living animal is, is prohibited. Also, ve'eze, what kind of blood are we talking about? Zedam hakaza, the blood from a bloodletting of an animal, shanefesh yotza abo, that the soul is contained within that. Now what it means that the soul is contained within it is that the Gemara describes elsewhere that there are different kinds of blood that flow from an animal when you draw the blood from it. There's different viscosities, there's different colors, and there's different rates of blood flow. And the Gemara describes that there are certain kinds of blood that uh, sort of uh, contain the essential soul of the animal, whatever that means, and that's what the Torah is coming to tell you, that not only is blood from a dead animal usher, but also blood which contains the essential life force of the animal is also going to be usher. Would that be prohibited to a koi as well, the blood from a live animal? That's a good question. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. Is it don't... considered a limb, or is it considered... Well, it's an interesting question. There is a discussion in the Gemara and Bechoros as far as fluids that emanate from a living animal, uh, whether they're prohibited to a non-Jew or not. Um, it, there, you could make the argument that it, if this is a par- part and parcel of the laws of Aver Menachai, then it would apply to a non-Jew as well. But it's an interesting point. I haven't. We'd have to think about it and see what the Meforshim say. Now, the Gemara's next question is Vaharei. So now let's go on to the next topic. So we've covered Aver Menachai. Let's go on to Shor Haniskal. Shor Haniskal is an animal that has to be put to death. Uh, uh, ostensibly in this case because it has gored someone and the Torah says that when an animal, when, an, when a bull gores a, a human being and kills it, you put the animal to death. 
So the Rachmana Amar Lo Ye Achel Es Bisaro. Now the Torah, when it talks about the the Shor Haniskal, it says that its flesh may not be consumed. Now here the Torah speaks in a passive conjugation of the verb. So as we're going to see, this is not just going to be a challenge to Rabbi Avo, but it's going to be a challenge to Chizkiah as well. Because Chizkiah taught us yesterday that he agrees that when the Torah uses the passive conjugation of the verb, it shall not be eaten, there he agrees that it, 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 uh, it, it subsumes under it not only in Isra Achila, but also in Isra Hanav, that you're not allowed to benefit from it as well. So we're going to have to see, am I allowed to benefit from a Shor HaNiskal's carcass or not? The Gemara says, Vitani, we have a brisa that says, Mimash Mishanam Arsakol Yisakel HaShor. If the Torah tells me that I have to stone the ox to death, any Yodeya Shehi Nevela Nevela Asura Ba'achila. So obviously that would imply that when the animal's dead, it's going to be a nevela. It hasn't been slaughtered properly. And if it hasn't been slaughtered properly, so then obviously I'm not allowed to eat it. So then why does the Torah have to tell me it may not be eaten? It's coming to tell me uh, a strange halacha, that what happens if the animal is brought to court the court finds it to be uh, guilty of the death penalty. So the court, the court pronounces this animal needs to be stoned to death. And on its way to being stoned to death, a guy takes out his, his chalif, he takes out his shechita knife, and he shechts the behemoth. So there the chiddush is that even though it was properly shechted, it's still aser ba'achila, it's still, you're still not allowed to eat it. And then <clears throat> the b'risa continues and it says as follows, Ein liela ba'achila ba'anominayin. But that only tells me that I'm not allowed to eat it. How do you know that you're not even allowed to benefit from the animal? Tamul Omar, uval hashor naki. So then we have another phrase in the Pasuk which says that the owner of the bull, or the, the ox, shall be innocent or clean. That's what the word naki, naki means, or literally means clean. Now, nor, in the context of the Pasuk, it means that once the animal is put to death, the owner is blameless, or he's blame, he's, he doesn't need any further atonement. But we also read the word clean. The Gemara asks, my mashma, what is, where do you see that that also means that you can't get hana'a from the animal? Shimon ben Zayma Omer, ka'adam shomer lechavero yatsa ploni naki minachasav, ve'en lo bahem hana'a shel klum. It's almost like people say in the vernacular, the guy was wiped clean. Yeah. Now, he were, or he was cleaned out. You ever hear that term? Yeah. He was cleaned out. He went to Vegas and he was cleaned out. Mm-hmm. Or he was invested in a business and they, yeah, it, clean, it cleaned him out. Lost his shirt. But here it's, he was cleaned out. So cleaned out means that you lost all your money. So therefore, when the Torah says that the owner of the ox is clean, not only does it mean that he's blameless, but it also means that he can get no financial benefit from this bull whatsoever. Mm-hmm. So, so therefore, you see, now the Gemara says, Taima de Kasev Ubala Shor Naki, Di'i Milo Ye Ochel Isr Achila Mashma Isr Hanalo Mashma. The Gemara's question is very clear. The Gemara is saying you need an extra clause in the Pasuk to tell you that you can't get Hana because from just from the words lo ye achel, it may not be eaten, that's not sufficient to tell you that there's an Isr Hana. Now this is a kasha both on Chizkiah and on Rabbi Avo, because both of them agree that when the Torah says lo ye achel, it implies both an Isr Achila and an Isr Hana. So how do you resolve this issue? So the Gemara says lo olam lo ye achel, Isr Achila ve Isr Hana mashma. says no. Really, when the Torah says lo yeachel, that implies both a prohibition of eating and a prohibition of hanah. Why does the Torah have to write that the owner of the ox shall be clean? That's to tell you that not only may he not benefit from the meat of the animal, but he may also not benefit from the hide of the animal, from the inedible portions of the animal. The itzterich, and I'll tell you why you need it, because salka daite chamina lo yeochelis besoro ksiv besoro in or lo kamash malan. Because when the Torah says, lo ye achel, I might, because it uses the verb of eating, I might have thought that it only applies to the consumable, to the edible portions of the animal. And therefore the Torah has to tell me that not only are the edible portions of the animal asr bahana, but even the non-edible portions of the animal, such as the hide, are also asr bahana. Doesn't it supposed to be automatically understood? That's no, that's the whole point. The whole point that the Gemara is making is that you only see an Isr Hana'a from the edible portions. And that's why you have to write it explicitly that even the non-edible portions are Asr Bahana. So now the Gemara says, okay, fine. 
But wait a minute. There are other Tanoim who use the phrase Ubal Hashor Naki, that the owner of the bull is clean. They use that Pasuk for other things. Like, for example, Lachatsi Kofir Uladimei Vlados. So one Tana says that the purpose of telling me that the owner of the, of the bull is clean is because I would have thought otherwise that even though he doesn't have to pay full damages, he might have to pay half damages, which is a discussion of Maseches Bavakama when you have a behema that's a, a tam, that is not, not an established core, sometimes it has to pay half damages. So maybe you'd have to pay half damages here uh, for the loss of life. And that's why the Gemara, that's according to this Tana, that's why that Torah has to write Bal Hashar Naki. There's another Tana who says that the reason why you have to write Ubal Hashor Naki is to tell me that when, when my bull kills a pregnant cow and it kills not only the mother but it also kills the fetus, then I'm all, I only have to, that I would have thought that I'm only exempt from paying for the mother but not for the fetus. And therefore the Torah has to write an additional phrase to tell me that I'm also exempt for pay, to, for, 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 from paying for the fetus. So the point is, is that you see that there are other uses for this Pasuk. So according to those Tanoim, Hanoas Arominolahu, where do they learn out that you may not benefit from the hide? The Gemara answers, Nafkuluhu may es bisaro, es atofilu bisaro. They learn it out from the fact that the Torah uses the word es. It, it, it says, lo ye achel es bisaro, the flesh may not be eaten. Now the word es does not have an English translation. Anytime you find the word S in the Torah, it precedes a definite article, the something. <clears throat> no, no, S it does not, no, it doesn't mean from. Sometimes S could mean with, sometimes it could mean with, but usually it doesn't have a definition. Usually it doesn't add anything to the English definition, but rather it precedes a definite article. So in that, if that's the case, so we can take this extra word S, which doesn't really add to the, to the meaning of the text, and use it to tell me that it's coming to teach me that what? That not only is the flesh prohibited, but something that is ancillary to the flesh, espisero, that which is ancillary to the flesh, is also forbidden, and that is the hide. The idach es lo darish. And the other, the Rabbi Avo and Chizkiah will tell you no, that you can't use, you can't derive anything from the word S. And this is a very important discussion. It's a, it's a very famous machloikes, very famous story about the, the, the rabbi who tried to expound on every time the Torah uses S. Kiritanya, Shimon HaAmsoni, Vramilo Nechem Yahamsoni, there's this rabbi, his name was either Shimon or Nechem Yahamsoni, Hayadorish Kol Esim Shubatora. He looked at every time the word Torah uses the word S, and he said there's a purpose for it, and he found a purpose for every single time the Torah writes to use the word S, until Kevin Shehigiyales Hashem Elokecha Tira Piresh, until he got to the pasuk which says that you shall fear the Lord your God, and that also has the word S. And he said, how can there be anything ancillary to God that I'm supposed to fear? This implies almost a type of duality to to the Godhead, to the divinity. And that, he felt, was, was heresy, and therefore he realized that his project was in vain, and he desisted and he said, that's it, I'm closing the books on this, I'm, close, I'm shutting down the project, no more funding for this, uh, for this, for this one. Well, he took it back. All those, not only did he stop. He stopped. Be re- he stopped. But he, so listen, listen yeah. to the story. So Amr lo Talmidov, so his student said to him, Rebbe kol esim shedarashta matahe alein. What about all of the esim that you had previously expounded upon? What are you going to say about them? So Amr lahem, keshem shikibalti schar drisha, kach ani mekabal schar prisha. So just like he said, just like I received reward for my toiling in this study, even though Perhaps I was mistaken, and I shouldn't have started, but since my intentions were to for Torah study, God will reward me for that. But he will also reward me for the prisha, for the desistance of this exercise, because I realize now that it was improper. Sometimes this is good to, to tell a rabbi, Rabbi, it's just like you'll get the reward for drisha, you'll also get reward for prisha. Right? Sometimes it's better not to say certain things. So if, you, if the drush is going on too long, now you know the line that you can tell the rabbi. Somebody so, told me, you know, if you get hard for talking to Shalashudik, what's hard for a leaf of Rishul? That's right. Ad sheva Rebbe Akiva Fedorash, es Hashem Elokecha Tira Lerabos Talmidei Chachamim. Until Rabbi Akiva came along and he said, 
you know what the word S is coming? What is ancillary to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that you <laughs> must revere? It is Talmidei Chachamim, God's emissaries in this world, who represent godliness through their Torah knowledge. That is also the object of reverence. And so that's what the S is coming to teach. Now, there's a lot to say about this, but at least what you see from this Gemara is that there's a machlokes tanoim, whether S has independent meaning that you can expound upon or not. And that's the same machlokas that we're seeing here. One group of, of tanoim hold that you can learn something from the word S, and the other hold that you cannot. <coughs> Let's go on to the next case. The hare orla. So let's go on to the next case. Now, orla is the produce of the tr- of the from the tree that is growing only for the first three years. It's a it's a new sapling. If it produces fruit during the first three years after its planting, so then that fruit is prohibited. So now, is orla prohibited just for hana uh, for achila or for hana as well? The Rachmana Omar Arelim Lo Yeachel. The Torah says again, using the passive verb. So this would be a challenge to Chizki as well. It, it may not be eaten. Vitanya arelim lo yeachel, enli ele iser achila, minay shelo yehena mimenu, shelo yiftza mimenu, velo yadu kosamer. So the Brysa says something that is a challenge immediately to Chizki and Rabbi Avohu. That Pasuk only tells me that I'm not allowed to eat it. How do I know that I'm not allowed to get hana from it as well, and that I'm not allowed to yitzaveyabo, that I'm not allowed to die with it? So for example, let's say I can take some of the bark of the tree and use that as a dye, and how do I know that I'm not even allowed to benefit from it even when I'm destroying it in the process of, like I'm incinerating it? How do I know that all of those are prohibited as well? Tamur lomar va'araltem orlaso arelim lo yeachel. The Torah uses the verb of orla three times in the Pasuk to tell me that not only is achila aser, but also these kinds of benefits are also going to be usher, so that tells me in toto that I'm not allowed to get hana from it. The rabbis is called to include all of them. But the Gemara says, Time to cause of Rahmana va'araltem or laso arelim, halav hachi havamina isra achila mashma isra hana lo mashma. So you see from here that the Torah has to add these extra orla words in the Pasuk because lo ye achel is not enough to tell me iser hana. This is again a challenge to both Chizki and Rebbe Avohu. So the Gemara says, la olam lo ye achel mashma ben iser achila ben iser hana. So the Gemara says, no. Really, when the Torah says lo ye achel, that includes both the iser achila and the iser hana. However, v'shayni hasam d'chsiv lachem. But the reason why I would think that Orla is different is because the Torah in the Pasuk says, Shalosh shanim lachem arelim. For three years of the, of, the, of the first three years of the plant's life, it shall be Orla for you. So the word for you implies that I am allowed to get something from it. And so in order to counteract that word lachem, the Torah has to write Orla three times in order to show me that not only is there an Isra Achila, but also an Isra Hana. So now the question, of course, is, well, then why do you have to write the word lachem and don't write those extra words orla? Obviously, the word lachem must be teaching me something differently. So, so the Gemara says... I might have thought since the Torah writes lachem that I'm allowed to get hana from it. Come ashmalan. So that's what the Torah is coming to teach me. But now I have another question. Now that the Torah has written lachem, so then why do I need? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. So the question is, why do I need lachem? What is the purpose that the Torah wrote Lachem? Wouldn't it have been easier to omit the words Orla, 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 and not write the word Lachem? So the Gemara says, Lachidatanya. No, there's a, a, a halacha that Lachem is coming to teach you. The Brisa says, Lachem Larabos es Hanatua Lirabim. So the Chachamim of this Brisa are of the opinion that not only is privately planted Orla prohibited, but also publicly owned Orla. If a community goes ahead and plants a public tree, those public works. That's you need a special pasuk to tell you that lachem, which includes the public, that also is going to be usher. And Reb could be used for Jews. So, no, no, no. We'll see. The Gemara says we're, we're going to explain it carefully. Reb Yehuda Omer lahotzi is hanatua lerabim, and Reb Yehuda says no. It's coming to exclude when it's planted for the public. In other words, according to Reb Yehuda, the prohibition of orla only a- applies to privately owned trees. But publicly owned trees, there's no prohibition of orla. So now let's see where they learn it from. My time at the Tanakama, what's the Tanakama's reasoning? Dichsiv unetatem liyachid mashma, lerabim lo mashma. 
because when the Torah says you in the plural shall plant, the way the Tanakhama understands the word unetatem in the plural means that God is speaking to each and every individual within all of Klal Yisrael. I'm speaking to six million individuals, and therefore I'm telling all each and every one of you don't plant. But that's a prohibition against the individuals planting. But l'rabim, but to say collectively, a public unity, can, a public unit cannot plant, that the Torah is not addressing, and that's why it's written in the plural, because it, God is addressing each person separately. So, kosov rachmon lachem, lahavi asanatu l'rabim, and that's why the Torah had to write lachem, to teach me that in addition to the individual prohibition, there's also a public prohibition as well, a, 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 when a tree is publicly owned. And the Rebbe Yehuda learns just the opposite. He says, Unatatem mashma bein l'rabim bein He says, no, the word you, plural, shall plant implies both individuals are included in this prohibition and a public, uh, own, publicly owned tree is included in the prohibition. The lachem bein yachid bein rabim mashma. And also, when it says lachem, it also includes both individuals and the community. So now I have two statements in the Pasuk that come to include a publicly owned tree to tell me that for the first three years it's also usher. But we have a principle of riboy achar riboy, of a riboy achar riboy, ven riboy achar riboy el lemoit. That whenever the Torah gives me two inclusionary clauses, it's almost like two negatives make a positive. When the Torah uses two inclusionary clauses, it adds up to one exclusionary clause. When the Torah comes to tell me two times unnecessarily that public, public trees are included in the prohibition of Orla, it really means to tell me that public trees are excluded from the prohibition of Orla. And therefore, Rabbi Yehuda says, that's how I know, using the word lachem, both of them use the word lachem. The Tanakhama uses the word lachem to tell you that the publicly owned tree is included in the prohibition of Orla, and Rabbi Yehuda tells you that the word lachem contributes to my knowledge that a publicly owned tree is excluded from the prohibition of Orla. But the bottom line is, that's why I need the word lachem, and once I need the word lachem, I need the Orla, Orla, Orla written three times to tell me that even though it's written lachem, there's still an iser of hana in a privately uh, owned tree and possibly even in a publicly owned tree. All right, you have a wonderful Shabbos, everyone.